All right. Okay. This is a really interesting story that I meant to get to earlier, but the Eliza stuff crept up. Okay. This is a big deal. Um, shout out to Billboard Chris for, for tweeting this out. I thought I was saving trans kids. Now I'm blowing the whistle. There are more than 100 pediatric gender clinics across the U.S. I worked at one. What's happening to children is morally and medically appalling. I'm a 42-year-old St. Louis native, a queer woman, and politically to the left of Bernie Sanders. My worldview has deeply shaped my career. I have spent my professional life providing counseling to vulnerable populations, children in foster care, sexual minorities, and the poor. For almost four years, I worked at the Washington University School of Medicine Division of Infectious Diseases with teens and young adults who were HIV positive. Many of them were trans or otherwise gender nonconforming. And I could relate. Through childhood and adolescence, I did a lot of gender questioning myself. I'm now married to a trans man. So she's a regular woman who's married to a trans man. Okay. So she's a lesbian. Uh, this, again, together we are raising my two biological children from a previous marriage and three foster children that we helped to adopt. All that led me to a job in 2018 as a case manager at the Washington University Transgender Center at St. Louis Children's Hospital, which had been established a year earlier. The center's working assumption was that the earlier you treat kids with gender dysphoria, the more anguish you can prevent later on. This premise was shared by the center's doctors and therapists. Given their expertise, I assumed that abundant evidence backed this consensus. During the four years I worked at the clinic as a case manager, I was responsible for patient intake and oversight. Around a thousand distressed young people came through our doors. The majority of them received hormone prescriptions that can have life altering consequences, including sterility. None of this is news to anybody. I left the clinic in November of last year because I could no longer participate in what was happening there. By the time I departed, I was certain the way the American medical system is treating these patients is the opposite of the promise we make to do no harm. This is also known as a Hippocratic Oath. Instead, we are permanently harming the vulnerable patients in our care. Today, I am speaking out. I am doing so knowing how toxic the public conversation is around this highly contentious issue and the ways that my testimony might be misused. I am doing so knowing that I am putting myself at serious personal and professional risk. Almost everyone in my life advised me to keep my head down, but I cannot in good conscience do so because of what is happening to scores of children is far more important than my comfort. And what is happening to them is morally and medically appalling. There's her with all her books. The floodgates opened. Soon after my arrival at the Transgender Center, I was struck by the lack of formal protocols for treatment. Interesting. The center's physician co-directors were essentially the sole authority. At first, the patient population was tipped downward, what used to be the traditional instance of a child with gender dysphoria, a boy, quite often young, who wanted to present as, who wanted to be a girl. Also, by the way, Abigail Schreier mentions a lot of this in her book, Irreversal Damage, which I highly recommend. Also, the instances of this were so low and rare, and it was mostly boys. Until 2015 or so, a very small number of these boys compromised the population of pediatric gender dysphoria cases. Then, across the Western world, there began to be a dramatic increase, increase in a new population, teenage girls with many many with no previous history of gender distress suddenly declared that they were transgender and demanded immediate treatment with testosterone. This is exactly what Abigail is talking about in her book. I certainly saw this at the center. One of my jobs was to do intake for new patients and their families. When I started there were probably 10 such calls a month. When I left, there were 50 and about 70% of the new patients were girls. Sometimes clusters of girls arrived from the same high school. Yep. This is exactly the point that it's a social contagion. It's a thing that friends are, are doing together. This concerned me, but I didn't feel I was in the position to sound the alarm back then. There was a team of about eight of us, and only one other person brought up the kinds of questions that I had. Anyone who raised doubts ran the risk of being called a transphobe. So if you ask questions, this is kind of the theme, the theme of the day. If you ask questions, you get you get name called. Kind of sounds like something else. The girls who came to us had many comorbidities, depression, anxiety, ADHD, eating disorders, obesity. Many were diagnosed with autism or had autism-like symptoms. A report last year on a British pediatric transgender center found that about one-third of the patients referred there were on the autism spectrum. 
yeah, so this speaks to there are other underlying issues going on. And people are transitioning as a way to soothe other issues. Frequently, our patients declared they had disorders that no one believed they had. We had patients who said they had Tourette syndrome, but they didn't. They said they had tic disorders, but they didn't. They said they had multiple personalities, but they didn't. The doctors privately recognized these false self-diagnoses as a manifestation of social contagion. They even acknowledged that suicide has an element of social contagion. But when I said the cluster of girls streaming into our service looked as if their gender issues might be a manifestation of social contagion, the doctors said gender identity reflected something innate. So she actually is bringing up concerns and the doctors are kind of thwarting it. They, to begin transitioning, the girls needed a letter of support from a therapist. Oh, not from a parent, but a therapist. What, uh, usually one we recommended. Oh, so the place that does transitions is the one that recommends the therapist that gives you the letter so that you can transition. Got it. Who they had to see only once or twice to get the green light. This is insane how little you actually need to make a permanent bodily decision. To make it more efficient for the therapist, we offered them a template for how to write a letter in support of transition. Ha! Oh, boy. And the place that's transitioning people is literally giving the therapist a template letter. So all they have to do is sign. They have to do, like, little, very little work. The next stop was a single visit. One visit to the endocrinologist for a testosterone prescription. So you only need to go see the therapist once and then you go visit and you can get your testosterone prescription. That's all it takes. When a female asks for testosterone, the profound and permanent effects of the hormone can be seen in a matter of months. That's how powerful this is. Voices drop, beards sprout, body fat is redistributed. Oh, this part probably isn't so bad. Uh, so sexual interest explodes, aggression increases, and mood can be unpredictable. Our patients were told about some side effects, including sterility, which means you can't have kids. But after working at the center, I came to believe that teenagers are simply not capable of fully grasping what it means to make the decision to become infertile while still a minor. Yeah, of course you're not able to grasp it. Literally, I, I graduated college. Uh, being sure that I didn't want to have kids. And that is, uh, what, how old was I when I graduated college? 20 or 21? So, of course, you're not able to make this decision as a minor. It's still like, it's so far away. You're not even, most kids aren't even thinking about it. Many encounters with patients emphasized to me how little these young people understood the pro profound effects. Uh, impacts changing gender would have on their bodies and minds, but the center downplayed the negative consequences and emphasized the need for transition. So they're literally pushing these kids to transition. As the center's website said, left untreated, gender dysphoria has any number of consequences from self-harm to suicide. But when you take away the gender dysphoria by allowing a child to be who he or she is, we're noticing that goes away. The studies will have uh, we have show these kids often wind up functioning psychosocially as well as or as better than their peers. Really? Because I think the studies actually show the exact opposite. That this increases after transitioning. There are no reliable studies showing this. In indeed, the experiences of many of the center's patients prove how false these assertions are. Here's one example. On Friday, May 1st, 2020, a colleague emailed me about a 15-year-old male patient. Oh, dear. I am concerned that the patient does not understand what bicalutamide, bicalutamide does. I responded, I don't think that we start, I don't think that we start anything, honestly, right now. So here's a letter. Um, oh, dear. I am concerned that blank. The patient does not understand what bicalutamide does. It's not just a blocker. It will cause breast development. The family seemed certain that was their first choice of therapy to start with. 
The statement made in the letter uh, that at times it seems scary. So she wants to move slowly, but eventually sees herself as being on estrogen is concerning. And who and the rote name at the end, what do we do now? I don't think that we start anything honestly right now. I think that this is a letter saying we may, we wait more time. And yes, I think that blank does not understand what bicalutamide does. Bicalutamide is a medication used to treat metastatic prostate cancer. And one of its side effects is that it feminizes the bodies of men who take it, including the appearance of breasts. The center prescribed this cancer drug as a puberty blocker and feminizing agent for boys. As with most cancer drugs, bicalutamide has had a long list of side effects, and this patient experienced one of them, liver toxicity. He was sent to another unit of the hospital for evaluation and immediately taken off the drug. Afterward, his mother sent an electronic message, that's an email, to the transgender care, saying that we were lucky her family was not the type to sue. So you have the parents pissed off that the doctors took their child off of a drug that was causing liver toxicity. This is what's so fucked up. It's it's literally, it's more important to these parents that their child transition than that their child be healthy and not have liver toxicity. That is beyond fucked. How little patients understood what they were getting into was illustrated by a call we received at the center in 2020 from a 17-year-old biological female patient who was on testosterone. She said she was bleeding from here, the veg, then less than an hour, she had soaked through an extra heavy pad, her jeans, and a towel that she had wrapped around her waist. Okay, that sounds bad. The nurse at the center told her to go to the emergency room right away. We found out later this girl had had intercourse, and because testosterone <gasps> thins the vaginal tissues, her vaginal canal had uh, ripped open. Oh, no. Yikes. She had to be sedated and given surgery to repair the damage. She wasn't the only vaginal laceration case we heard about. Oh, my God. That's horrible. Other girls were dist uh, disturbed by the effects of testosterone on their clitoris, which enlarges and grows into what looks like a microphallus or a tiny penis. I counseled one patient whose enlarged clitoris now extended below her vulva and it chafed and rubbed painfully in her jeans. I advised her to get the kind of compression undergarments worn by biological men who dress to pass as female. At the end of the call, I thought to myself, wow, we hurt this kid. Wow. I mean, it's nice that these people are having uh, some sympathy here, like it's hitting them. There are rare conditions in which babies are born with atypical genitalia. Yeah, it's called intersex. Cases that call for sophisticated care and compassion. But clinics like the one where I worked are creating a whole cohort of kids with atypical genitals. And most of these teens haven't even had sex yet. So they're literally creating more of these intersex types. They had no idea who they were going to be as adults, yet all it took for them to permanently transform themselves was one or two co short conversations with an adult, with a therapist. Yeah, who literally get paid to co uh, convince you to go down this path. It's so fucked up. Being put on powerful doses of testosterone or estrogen enough to try to trick your body into mimicking the opposite sex affects the rest of the body. I doubt, yeah, it stops your brain development too. I doubt that any parent who's ever consented to give their kid testosterone, which is a lifelong treatment, knows that they're also possibly signing their kid up for blood pressure medication, cholesterol medication, and perhaps sleep apnea and diabetes. But sometimes, yeah, because your body wasn't built to handle this amount of this hormone. But sometimes the parent's understanding of what they had agreed to do to their child came forcefully, like this mother. Oh, this is an email from June 9th of 2022. Hello, please be advised that I'm revoking my consent for this course of medical treatment. Um, grades have dropped. There's been an inpatient behavioral health visit, and now he's on five different medications. Wow. Damn. Lexapro, Tradazone, Buspar, etc. Blank is a shell of his former self, riddled with anxiety. Who knows if it's because the hormone blockers or the other medications. I revoke my consent. I want the hormone blocker removed. Thank you. Wow. This poor kid. I mean, you shouldn't be on any of these medicines. 
maybe I'm old school. Like I'm just, I have never been on anything. I, this must be fucking with the kids so much. Neglected and mentally ill parents. This is crazy. Okay, this is a long article. I've ignored the chat. Let me look at the chat. Make sure everyone's okay. Besides teenage girls, another new group was referred to us, young people from the inpatient psychiatric unit or the emergency department of St. Louis Children's Hospital. The mental health of these kids was deeply concerning. There were diagnoses like schizophrenia, PTSD, bipolar disorder, and more. Often they were already on a fistful of pharmaceuticals. Big Pharma is fucking up a generation of kids. My goodness. This was tragic but unsurprising given the profound trauma some had been through. Yet no matter how much suffering or pain a child had endured or how little treatment and love they had received, our doctors viewed gender transition, even with all the expense and hardship it entailed, as the solution. Whoa. Probably because they get a stellar kickback. Uh, some weeks it felt as though almost our entire caseload was nothing but disturbed young people. Because they are. For example, one teenager came to us in the summer of 22 when he was 17 years old and living in a lockdown facility because he had been sexually abusing dogs. Oh, no. He had an awful childhood. His mother was a drug addict. His father was imprisoned and he grew up in foster care. Whatever treatment he may have been getting, it wasn't working. During our intake, I learned from another caseworker that when he got out, he planned to reoffend because he believed that the dogs had willfully submitted. Oh, no. Somewhere along the way, he expressed a desire to become female, so he ended up being seen at our center. From there, he went to a psychologist at the hospital who was known to approve virtually everyone seeking transition. Then our doctor recommended feminizing hormones. At the time, I wondered if this was being done as a form of chemical castration. Whoa. The same thought came up again with another case. This one was in the spring of 22 and a concerned young man who had intense obsessive compulsive disorder that manifested as a desire to, uh, let's say, Lorena Bobbitt himself after he, uh, wow, pleasured himself. That's not good. This patient expressed no gender dysphoria, but he got hormones too. Whoa. I asked the doctor what protocol he was following, but I never got a straight answer. This is horrible negligence. Um, another disturbing aspect of the center was its lack of... Reg Where is this place, this center? Another disturbing aspect of the center was its lack of regard for the rights of parents <laughs> and the extent to which doctors saw themselves as more informed decision makers over the fate of these children. This is disgusting. This is exactly what we don't like about these woke teachers who make TikToks and like come out to their classes. It's like parents are losing their own control over their own kids. It's very scary. In Missouri, only one patient's parent's consent is required for treatment of their child. Wow, this is in Missouri. But when there was a dispute between the parents, it seemed the center always took the side of the affirming parent. Of course, because that's how they're going to make money. My concerns about this approach to dissenting parents grew in 2019 when one of our doctors actually testified in a custody hearing against a father whose mother, who opposed a mother's wish to start their 11-year-old on puberty. Why is it always the mom that wants to transition the kid and the dad doesn't? Why is this always the case? Damn, like these doctors are actually meddling in custody, he custody hearings. That's so fucked. If I had done the original intake call, I found the mother quite disturbing. She and the father were getting divorced and the mother described the daughter as kind of a tomboy. So now the mother was convinced her child was trans. But when I, I feel like this, this mom is like literally transing the kid to take it out on the uh, husband. I know that's so fucked up, but I. I feel like that's what's happening here. But when I asked if the daughter had adopted a boy's name, if she was distressed about her body, if she was saying she felt like a boy, the mother said no. I explained the girl just didn't meet the criteria. So this mom wants to trans her kid because she's a tomboy. To get back at the dad for divorcing her. Great. That's healthy. Then a month later, the mother called back and said her daughter now used a boy's name, was in distress over her body, and wanted to transition. This, yeah, because probably she convinced her to feel that way. This time, the mom and daughter were given an appointment. Our providers decided the girl was trans and prescribed a puberty blocker to prevent her normal development. 
The father adamantly disagreed, and this was all coming from the mother, and a custody battle ensued after the hearing where our doctor testified in favor of transition. The judge sided, the judge sided with the mother. Ugh. I raised my concern about parental rights and consent in emails like this one. So this is from July of June of 21. Thanks. I was not having any issue with interrupting. Uh, and I'm sorry. Thanks. I was not having any issue with interpreting or understanding the elements that she commented on below. I was looking at the bigger question about how consent is now being determined. My concerns are that the judge is essentially removing the element of parental consent and placing it in our hands. The judge could have awarded the medical decision making, uh, making to the, uh, the dad or awarded the legal custody to the dad. Instead, the judge put in the center's hands the decision making for medical transition. And this is a patient who is not yet 16. Holy fuck, that's fucked up. Because I was the main intake person, I had the broadest perspective on our existing and prospective patients. In 2019, a new group of people appeared on my radar, D-sisters and D-transitioners. D-sisters chose not to go through with the transition. D-transitioners are transgender people who decide to return to their birth gender. The one colleague with whom I was able to share my concerns agreed with me that we should be tracking desistance and detransition. We thought the doctors would want to collect and understand this data in order to figure out what they missed. We were wrong. One doctor wondered aloud why he would spend time on someone who was no longer his patient. That's disgusting. But we created a document anyway and called it the red flag list. It was an Excel spreadsheet that tracked the kind of patients that kept my colleague and me up at night. One of the saddest cases, cases of detransition I witnessed was a teenage girl who, like so many of our patients, came from an unstable family was in an uncertain living situation and had a history of drug use. The overwhelming majority of our patients were white, but this girl was black. She was put on hormones at the center when she was around 16. When she was 18, she went in for a double mastectomy, what's known as top surgery. Three months later, she called the surgeon's office to say she was going back to her birth name and that her pronouns were she and her. Heartbreakingly, she told the nurse, I want my breasts back. The surgeon's office contacted her office because they didn't know what to say to this girl. My colleague and I sat, said that we would reach out. It took a while to track her down. And when we did, we made sure that she was in decent mental health, that she was not actively suicidal, and that she was not using substances. The last I heard, she was pregnant. Of course, she'll never be able to breastfeed her child. Whoa. So it sounds like she had top surgery, but didn't, um, ha like, wasn't put on hormones. <gasps> That's horrible. My concerns about what I was go what was going on at the center started to overtake my life. By spring of 2020, I felt a medical and moral obligation to do something. So I spoke up in the office and sent plenty of emails. Here's just one example. On January 6, 2022, this is like last month, I received an email from a staff therapist asking me for help with a case of a 16-year-old transgender male living in another state. Parents are open to having patients see a therapist but are not supportive of gender and patient does not want parents to be aware of gender identity. I'm having a challenging time finding a gender affirming therapist. I replied, I do not ethically agree with linking a minor patient to a therapist who would be gender affirming with gender as a focus of their work without that being discussed with the parents and then the parent agreeing to that kind of care. Yeah, this is like a normal thing to say. Okay. Here's the article. Uh, this might be best discussed on a call, but I do not eth ethically agree with linking a minor patient to a therapist that would affirm. Um, within the center, we do not link minor patients to gender affirming care without the consent of at least one parent or guardian. And now we're getting to the point where you don't need any parents' consent. They're just going to hook them up with the guard with the therapists. In all my years at the Washington University School of Medicine, oh, okay, that's where this is. I had received solidly positive performance reviews, but in 21, that changed. I got a below average mark for my judgment and working relationships, cooperative spirit. Yeah, for asking questions. She gets penalized. Although I was described as responsible, conscientious, hardworking, and productive. The evaluation also noted, at times, Jamie responds poorly to direction from management with defensiveness and hostility. Whoa. So they're threatening her job. 
Things came to a head at a half-day retreat in summer of 22 in front of his team. The doctor said that my colleague and I had to, had to stop questioning the medicine and the science as well as their authority. Then an administrator told us we had to get on board or get out. I guess we know what choice they made. So they're threatening. They're straight up threatening her. The Washington University system provides a generous college tuition payment program for longstanding employees. I live by my paycheck and I have no money to put aside for five tuitions for my kids. I had to keep my job. I also feel a lot of loyalty to Washington University. But I decided then and there that I had to get out of the transgender center. And to do so, I had to keep my head down and improve my next performance review. I managed to get a decent evaluation, and I landed a job coordinating research in another part of the Washington University School of Medicine. I gave my notice and left the Transgender Center in November of 22. Wow. So just a few months ago. For a couple weeks, I tried to put everything behind me and settled into my new job. Then I came across comments from Do Dr. Rachel Levine, a transgender woman who is a high official in the Federal Department of Health and Human Services. The article read, Levine, the U.S. Assistant Secretary for Health, said that clinics are proceeding carefully and that no American children are receiving drugs or hormones for gender dysphoria who shouldn't. Ha! Ha ha! I felt stunned and sickened. It wasn't true. And I know that from deep firsthand experience. So I started writing down everything I could about my experience at Transgender Center. Two weeks ago, I brought my concerns and documents to the attention of Missouri's at Attorney General. He is a Republican. I'm a progressive, but the safety of the children should not be a matter for our culture wars. Given the secrecy and lack of rigorous standards that characterize youth gender transition across the country, I believe that to ensure the safety of American children, we need a moratorium on the hormonal and surgical treatment of young people with gender dysphoria. In the past 15 years, according to Reuters, the U.S. has gone from having no pediatric gender clinics to more than 100. A thorough analysis should be undertaken to find out what has been done to these to their patients and why and what are the long-term consequences. There is a clear path for us to follow. Just last year, England shut down the Tavistock Center, the only youth gender clinic in the country after an investigation revealed shoddy practices and poor patient treatment. Sweden and Finland too have investigated pediatric transition and greatly curbed the practice, finding there is insufficient evidence of help and great danger uh, and danger of great harm. Some critics describe the treatment offered at places like the Transgender Center where I worked as kind of a national experiment. Yikes. But that's wrong. Experiments are supposed to be carefully designed. Hypotheses are supposed to be tested ethically. The doctors I worked alongside at the Transgender Center said frequently about the treatment of our patients. We are building the plane while we are flying it. Isn't this what they said about COVID too? Damn. They don't know what the fuck they're doing, but they are making a ton of money. No child should be a passenger on that kind of aircraft. Wow. What an incredibly brave woman to come out and speak about this. Jamie Reed, props to you. I hope you don't get, a, well, you're probably going to get shit for this, but respect to you, girl. Wow. Love you guys. Thank you for the chats. Thank you for the comments. I will see you guys tomorrow. Bye. Bye. All right. Love you guys. Oh, I don't even want to leave. This candle smells so good. I don't want to leave. All right. Love you guys. Talk to you soon. Bye. Love you all. Join the Discord. Feet. Love you all. Wow. You guys are awesome. Don't even get it. Bye, guys. Bye. Now I'm really leaving. Love you. Bye.